Dear Commissioner Hill, thank you very much for giving us a reality check. Let me now call on the moderator of our first panel today, Professor Dr. Stegemann, who is senior partner of McKinsey. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you very much to my predecessors, um, Minister Schäfer, uh, Mr. Grillo, and Commissioner Hill for such rich input uh, into the panel discussion uh, that we are now going to approach. Um, seven years on from the global recession, uh, the European economic recovery remains sluggish, encouraging developments, as Mr. Grillo said, in countries like Ireland, Portugal, and Spain are coupled with growth projections for Europe's large economies that, although slightly improved, remain low. According to Commissioner Hill, the EU has done a huge amount of work to ensure that we have a safe, stable financial system that is robust enough to cope with challenging times. On the other hand, the regulatory energy shift in Germany has brought a fundamental revaluation of the country's energy sector, and I'm sure not a lot of people in this room um, envied our panelist, Mr. Schäfer from E.ON, who communicated E.ON's financial performance last week. So the stability of the Eurozone remains a concern. Growth is still slow, and regulation plays an important role. Output lags 15% below the pre-crisis trend, and monetary policy has uh, so far not fully resolved the demand deficit. Measures to unlock financing can help, but so far they have been insufficient on their own. And it remains to be seen whether the prescription of quantitative easing and higher fiscal spending can be easily replicated in the Eurozone. Overall, pessimism dominates the discourse on this issue. But amid all the gloom, there's still much to celebrate. Um, Europe has fundamental strengths on which to build on. Countries that lead the world in key social and economic aspects can be found across the continent. Think of Germany's trade competitiveness, think of the United Kingdom's strength in services, Portugal's record in bringing women into the workforce, Poland's resilience throughout the crisis, Estonia's adoption of digital technologies in the public sector, or Denmark's energy efficiency. So many of the solutions to Europe's economic problems seem to exist right here in the heart of Europe. The question for this panel today center on how to use uh, Europe's strengths as a platform for robust growth, how to address some of the remaining weaknesses and roadblocks, and how regulation impacts Europe's growth prospects. So that's heavy stuff. Um, and I'm looking at you, I'm seeing some of you are approaching the troughs of your bio curve already. I've uh, experienced that as well when I was sitting you know, as comfortably as you in the chairs of the audience. And the presenter and the moderator was doing his best to you know, talk about a complex issue. And he did a reasonably good job. But after five, six, seven minutes, an individual in the last row fell asleep. <laughs> Nothing wrong about falling asleep. But another five minutes later, the individual started snoring. <laughs> that concerned the moderator. And he asked the neighbor of the sleeping guy, excuse me, could you please wake your neighbor up? And he said, no, you put him to sleep. You wake him up yourself. <laughs> I am pretty sure this is not going to happen uh, in this panel because we have a terrific set uh, of panelists uh, that will share uh, their view. They're representing uh, the private and the public banking sector. They're representing the energy sector, an innovative production industry, and the ECB responsible for monetary policy and European banking supervision. So let me call uh, upon my fellow panelists here, uh, one after the other. Let me start with uh, Frank Lutz, Chief Financial Officer of Baya Material Science, uh, with sales of 11.2 billion euros in 2013. Baya Material Science is among the world's largest manufacturers of high-tech polymer materials. The company's innovative products and solutions are used in many key industrial sectors, a subsidiary of the Bayer Group with some 14,300 employees Biomaterial science has a global presence. Mr. Lutz has worked for Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank and has served MAN and Aldi Süd as chief financial officer before assuming his current CFO role in October 2014. So, Mr. Lutz, if I 
me ask you to join us here on the panel. Second, we have Klaus Schäfer, Chief Financial Officer of E.ON. Uh, E.ON is an international privately owned energy supplier which faces fundamental change. Through implementing its new strategy, E.ON will in future be focusing entirely on renewables, energy networks and customer solutions, which are the building blocks of the new energy world. The conventional generation, global energy trading and exploration and production business segments are being transferred to a new company, which will be also listed. In the 2014 financial year, 48,000 employees based across Europe as well as in Russia and North America generated sales of around 112 billion euro. And within the renewable segment, E.ON claims to be one of the world's leading companies. After his career at Morgan Stanley, Mr. Schäfer has been with FIAC and E.ON for almost 20 years since September 2013 in his role as CFO. <laughs> Dr. Ingrid Hengster, member of the executive board at KFW, Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, is a German government-owned development bank based in Frankfurt. With its 5,300 employees and a balance sheet of around 500 billion euro, KFW focuses on four group units, housing and environment, small and medium enterprises, development aid, as well as export and import finance. Dr. Hengster has worked for an impressive cross-section of European banks, UBS, Commerce Bank, Credit Suisse First Boston, ABN AMRO, the Royal Bank of Scotland, amongst others, before commencing her current role as member of the executive board at, at KFW, responsible for domestic promotion and development in April 2014. Martin Krebs, member of the executive board at ING DIBA in Frankfurt, responsible for commercial banking, treasury, securities and custody business and economic research. ING DIBA is with a balance sheet of roughly 130 billion euros, uh, the third largest retail bank with more than 8 million clients in Germany. The bank is known for a limited but transparent product offering and its efficiency and cost focus. Mr. Krebs previously worked for Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan before joining ING in 2003 and assuming his current role in 2006. <laughs> Dr. Peter Preit, executive board member and chief economist at the European Central Bank, before assuming his position as chief economist at the ECB in June 2011. In Frankfurt, Mr. Preit has been working as professor of economics at Fortis Bank and as Chief of Staff for the Belgian Minister of Finance. Furthermore, he was Executive Director of the National Bank of Belgium and member of the Board of the Banking, Finance and Insurance Commission. Morning. 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 Good. Our approach today will be to ask some simple questions that the panelists can respond to with either yes or no, or by rating one alternative above the other. A show of hands will then help us identify the most interesting areas to explore in more depth with our panelists. So here's an intro question um, to warm us up. Is Europe's sluggish growth primarily the consequence of a weak financing supply? or weak investment by public and private companies and national budgets. So show of hands for supply of financing as the prime reason for the sluggish growth. Supply of financing. <laughs> <laughs> investment. Good. I guess but, uh, but you squeeze us in yes, <laughs> no, you know. Uh, Makes it difficult. Sort of. <laughs> and I'm sure you agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> This was to warm us up, Mr. Pay. This was to warm us up, exactly right. Now, next question. Um, maybe that can get us even hotter here. Can monetary policy close the financing, or in this case, investment gap? <laughs> no. Yes? No. 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 It can contribute, but yeah. it cannot. It helps, but it doesn't solve. Mr. Pay, does this response surprise you? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's obvious, so it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> warm up. You want to share a few thoughts with us about the ECB's efforts <laughs> yes, of in course. conjunction with growth? Yes, that's why I'm, why I'm here. So, uh, good morning. Um, about your general introduction. First, 
First, um, we have a recovery. We had this, you remember, V-shaped recession in 2009. We had an abordered recovery in 2010, a long U-shaped recession. We had a, a recovery, a third recovery then uh, in 2013 and, and 14. It slowed down in 14 again. And we had a high risk of, you know, aborting against uh, and having, as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, perhaps a third recession. And that's why, uh, you know, we launched this message at the ECB, basically at the Jackson Hole uh, communication of Mario Draghi, by saying we need a comprehensive policy response to all the problems we have. Monetary policy would be one part of the response, and we will discuss that, I'm sure. But it's absolutely clear that this is not the essential part. We have no uh, recovery. I think it's, it's uh, confirmed in the most recent data that we have. You know our projections seem to be, for many of you, uh, quite optimistic. But I think what is very important to say is that this is uh, what we call a cyclical recovery. Uh, we will see the figures, but it's cyclical. It's not structural. And so we will have to, we have to discuss you know, what the structural problems are. And uh, that's why we are here, actually. So monetary policy plays a role, of course, but it's not the essential role. And certainly it cannot do it alone. I mean, we all agree with that. It's not controversial. And given uh, that we have the real that. economy around the table, let's dive a bit deeper into Europe's um, growth prospects. So let me start with another yes, no question again. Does Europe in itself have a foundation of strength on which to build on beyond the ECB measures? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. So what do you think are what do you think are Europe's main structural strengths that you know can positively impact the uh, can positively impact uh, the growth prospects? of the economy and maybe even your individual companies. Mr. Lutz, you're representing a fast-growing, innovative company. I guess this is something that keeps you awake at night. Well, fortunately enough, it does not keep me that much awake because I do think that we have uh, a foundation of wealth in Europe and the pure fact that <coughs> we do have the European Union, I think, is, is something that supports um, our wealth here in Europe. I think. Uh, infrastructure is an important aspect to it, especially if you are a globally producing company. You value uh, stability in terms of infrastructure a lot. Um, stability also, I think, in itself is an important factor, despite the fact that I think we have had so much stability in Europe that we have uh, forgotten how to deal with some kind of instability. And I think this is something uh, that uh, we need to get better at. Talking about infrastructure, Dr. Hengster. Yeah. We're heavily in the market. Uh, are we building infrastructure just in Asia and Africa, or is there also a case for infrastructure investment across Europe? There is, of course, also a case for infrastructure across Europe. And when you raised the question earlier, what are our strengths, I would have really <coughs> pointed to one specific strength, which is the existing infrastructure. We can argue there is a lot of investment needed at the moment, which is true. But if you compare globally, I think the, the, our infrastructure in Europe is still strong. Um, we have uh, heard about the uh, Juncker plan earlier when, uh, when um, in, the, in the first speeches. Um, there will be really enormous investment to make sure that uh, private and public investment will be facilitated and will be used to boost European infrastructure. Looking at KFW, we are also contributing. Um, we are contributing up to 8 billion for, in the broad sense, uh, infrastructure um, investments, particularly via project financings, which should then come over the next years. So infrastructure is a huge area of interest, a huge area of strength at the moment already, but really something which is needed to get growth again into the European market. We're talking about classical infrastructure at the same you can look at um, the digital agenda of Europe. We need a unified agenda. We are thinking and, and talking uh, to the government at the moment about what can be done uh, in Germany to promote the build-up of the digital infrastructure. But of course, the same is also needed on a European level. By definition, I was pretty sure that you would have a positive view about infrastructure and infrastructure yeah. financing across Europe uh, as a government-owned development bank, Mr. Krebs. You're increasingly also uh, getting into the business of you know, SME financing. Do you share that view? Uh, yes, indeed. I just also wanted to add a few points on, on the strength, if, you, if, you, yeah. if I may. 
I think one of the potentials of Europe is also diversity. You know, we are a very diverse continent with a lot of different backgrounds historically, and if we le basically leverage the potential rather than basically fighting about it, <laughs> that is a, a substantial hidden reserve that we have. Um, and uh, uh, the same also goes for the, in general, very legal, uh, stable legal system that we have. Uh, political systems are stable. They're not yet harmonized, but there's a lot of potential again to actually leverage this uh, by learning, as was mentioned all, earlier in your examples, out from each other and making the best out of the, yeah, uh, of the European Union as a whole, as opposed to individual countries. There was a setback, of course, with the crisis, uh, more small nationalism uh, coming back to the uh, uh, thinking of uh, politicians, or bankers as well. But I can sense that there is a turning point again where that is more sort of in the past and looking forward, again, there's more harmonization to be accomplished. You mentioned the stability of the legal framework. Now I can't help to turn to my right-hand side. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, what's your view? I would have loved to say yes, sort of like that is the case. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, sometimes if I get asked these days about the stability of systems and also of uh, legal systems, uh, sort of like Germany, which would have been on the top of my mind 10 years ago, I guess with all the changes in the energy, energy law and the decisions that have been taken, clearly I would no longer be a supporter of that statement for Germany. There are other countries around, obviously, where that is still the case in Europe, uh, but also share some of the points clearly that my uh, colleagues here said uh, on, the, on the stage. Um, for me, it's still the question of the development that we've seen. Infrastructure is still extremely strong in Europe. Everyone who's done business in the US, for example, I think can vouch for that. Uh, the outage times, for example, on energy in Germany compared to US, I mean, it's a That's fraction it. that we see here. On the other hand, it's declining. It's not improving, it's going down. If I look at the core industrial base, which I always felt is an extreme strength of Europe, mm, we're not reinvesting into that core industrial base. That industrial base is moving into other you know, geographies, I mean, US to Asia, uh, other places. And again, I see a negative trend uh, on that one. And also the third strength for me was always the question of science. Uh, quality of universities, the quality of research that's being done. I think also there we're on a declining stage. We're still very strong on the fundamental side, but turning that into products, turning that into the real economy, I believe sort of like here we're not on a, on a good track, but it's actually declining. And again, I see that in my industry, but I take it is also true for many other industries that, uh, that uh, we still have in Europe. So in general, I sense a relatively positive view about the level of you know, infrastructure and some of the other assets that we were talking about. However, I sense yeah. there might be a negative, slightly negative momentum uh, that we need to yeah. tackle. So let's maybe talk about what we can do about this negative momentum. Uh, there's much talk about the consolidation of public budgets on the one hand and ambitious you know, programs for job creation and economic growth on the other. Um, and Commissioner Hill uh, pointed out um, the uh, investment plan to unlock public and private finance uh, in the uh, real economy of more than, I think it was 315 billion euro over the next three years. Um, in addition to this large pot of money, which of the following six structural changes um, or game changers for growth would you consider a top three priority? Mm -hmm. Please be disciplined. Each participant has three votes, but I will pose you six alternatives. And I would like the audience to check whether any one of the panelists raises his hands four times or more. <laughs> or not at all. Well, not at all, yeah. Six alternatives. Alternative number one, investing for the future, e.g. effective paths from education to employment, optimizing and productively nurturing innovation and digitization, the energy shift as an innovation engine or developing infrastructure. That would be my first alternative, investing for the future. The second alternative would be boosting productivity, e.g. achieving competitive and integrated markets and services and digital, unlocking public sector productivity and opening up further to trade. TTIP could be one example. Boosting productivity, the second alternative. The third alternative, mobilizing the workforce, increasing gray and female labor force participation, being smart about non-European immigration, enhancing labor market flexibility and intra-European mobility. So mobilizing the workforce would be my third proposition. Fourth one would be improving financing for businesses. We heard a lot about this uh, in Commissioner Hill's speech and also Mr. Grillo was referring to it. Substituting bank financing with capital markets financing, strengthening equity financing versus debt financing, strengthening the supply of venture capital and long-term investment, e.g. from pension funds and insurance. So fourth one would be improving financing for business. Fifth one, 
faster repair of national budget balance sheets, uh, debt restructuring in Greece, a post-Maastricht fiscal approach, um, closer fiscal integration. And my sixth one would be a fundamental redesign of Europe's regulatory approach towards banking and the financial markets and a European consolidation of national regulatory approaches towards, for instance, the labor product and the energy markets. So let me quickly recap. Number one, in investing for the future. Number two, boosting productivity. Number three, mobilizing the workforce. Number four, improving financing for businesses. Number five, faster repair of national budgets. Six, a fundamental redesign of regulation. So show of hands for number one, investing for the future. One, two, three, four, four. <laughs> Second, boosting productivity. Yeah, yeah. One, two, three, four. Hmm. Okay, mobilizing the workforce, one, two. The real economy. Improving <laughs> the real economy, that's right. <laughs> Improving financing for business. That's surprising. Oh, there we go, yeah. two, okay, yeah, good. <laughs> good, you rescued this panel here. Faster repair of national budget and balance sheets, one. And a fundamental redesign of Europe's regulatory approaches. One. <laughs> okay, <laughs> does that's no, but I mean, does that offset the one from over here? <laughs> no, it's no, because there are oh. missing missing uh, priorities in, in in the six. Some are overlapping, if I may. Uh, the missing, I think, listening to the the previous speakers, is the uh, institutional infrastructure. Institutional. Uh, we have, for example, uh, that has been mentioned, the judicial system in some countries. The time it takes to open and close a business. Uh, how do you settle uh, relations between creditors and debtors when they're in trouble? Mm -hmm. So many of these things uh, I would have put as a top priority, the institutional uh, infrastructure, Ordnungspolitik, natürlich, <laughs> in Deutschland. But I would have put it at one of the top priorities in, Euro in Europe. Uh, and, and that's behind most of the teams that you have here. And you mentioned that was uh, the, yeah. the, uh, the, the difficulties of the regulatory environment. Now, when you say about uh, harmonization, European consolidation of national regulatory approaches, I said this because it can be anything. It depends how you do the, the, harm, the sort of harmonization. It can be the worst of all the worst. It can be best practices or it can be the worst practices being harmonized, you know, that sort of debates. That's why I put my finger there. That I'm always optimistic on those things. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So an immediate additional response to the finger down? I think uh, Professor Pratt is obviously right, sort of, uh, it depends in what direction we're going. Yes, of course. Nevertheless, to me, I mean, I'm, I'm still a believer in open markets, in free markets, in the liberal markets. Yeah? But to me, regulation is a necessary must where there's market failure or obviously where there's a monopoly situation. Uh, and therefore, I mean, I've seen way too much regulation in the past, and therefore this fundamental redesign, and that's why I said I'm an optimist on that one, yeah, for me would be actually to have less regulation going forward, and again, re-belief in the market uh, in terms of allocating capital and giving us a direction, uh, maybe sort of like I was interpreting the, uh, the question sort of like too positively, if it were to go in a, in a direction where we have even more regulation, even more state involvement, even more boundaries sort of like for normal economic activity, I think that clearly I, can, I would I not, can, have, I I would have not taken that, that as a priority. Which was not the intention of the question, Thank that's you. for sure. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I was listening to my colleagues here, and uh, when you presented these six uh, game changers, I feel all of them are important. And for me, it's very difficult to say, let's pick this or let's pick that, because mm. if one of uh, these game changers is not in place, uh, finally, we will not succeed. But if I have to make a choice, this is why I have taken the first one, the second one, and I think the one on the financing. Uh, these are the three elements which are preconditions uh, to me uh, to, make, uh, to make sure that uh, things get started and that we move in the right direction. And of course, I could argue in particular, uh, coming from KFW, about all three of them. Financing is a big topic, and I'm sure you will have more questions on what is uh, necessary in terms of uh, financing instruments. But also the first um, um, game changer, investing into the future, is extremely important when you speak about education. For example, KFW um, invests every year a lot of money to make sure that all students can really go to university or you have to look at the climate environmental protection where we again as promotional banks um, invest a lot of money 
13 billion alone in energy efficiency to make sure that things get implemented and started. So these are really important elements. And um, the second one, boosting productivity. I'm sure that's uh, something which is extremely high on the agenda of our real economy colleagues here um, on the stage. Um, we have to remain competitive. Um, competitiveness, um, uh, when you look to Asia or to the US, is, is a big topic when you look at our big companies and therefore making sure that in, we invest here, that we support our companies, our corporates, not only the small ones, but also the big ones, with programs to remain innovative um, and always remain on the edge of the next developments is extremely important. So for me, these would be the three really key game changers uh, to make sure that we can uh, stimulate growth in Europe. Mr. Lutz, you are in a fast-growing environment. How would you see things? Well, I first of all would like to take a little bit of a different approach on regulation. I think uh, if we ask the question in this room here who is uh, uh, for more or less regulation, probably most of you, uh, including myself, would go for less regulation. On the other hand, I think if I ask the question six or seven years ago, especially related to the financial industry, uh, a lot of us would have answered, including myself as well, we need more regulation in certain aspects of the industry. So therefore, I think it's not a pick and choose. I think uh, ultimately um, we need to be able, every industry needs to be able to deal with the regulation and regulation needs to develop. I think the sudden shifts are the things that create problems for us. Um, and that's true also for our industry. If we have, have sudden changes in how some, um, some chemical um, uh, precursors of what uh, of the, uh, that are necessary for our business if they are dealt diff they w if we have to deal with them differently and that is a sudden change that creates problems for us if it's a pro process uh, that we see coming if we have a couple of years to adjust our production uh, to the new regulation that's not so much of an issue it might cost us some money but on the other hand that also creates uh, some um, uh, some additional work so to speak Great. Can I add, yeah. add one point, just because this regulatory topic, I mean, for the real economy, is tremendously important. I think likewise for the for the financial sector. Uh, sometimes, and and to me, the most important thing, it's a bit like a drug. Yeah? I mean, you design it to have a certain effect, but you somehow sort of like disregard the side effects of that drug and or regulation at that point. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think, especially on the on the financial side, I mean, there was many regulation and many regulatory topics developed over the last years. Uh, unfortunately, no one has really looked at what's the negative effect on the real economy of those. Uh, I mean, everyone, I think, would have a different view on the financial transaction tax, about the benefits or non-benefits, whatever. Uh, but people sort of like disregard that this holds true for the banks, it holds true for industries which simply sort of like hedge their commodity exposure, do risk management in that way, therefore reduce the risks, but they're being penalized sort of like by additional taxes on that one. Likewise, sort of like a lot of financial regulation, MIFID and other topics, that again have some pretty severe side effects on the real economy. I know from Commissioner Hill, I know from people in the European Union sort of like that this was not the designed and the desired effect. Unfortunately, it's a side effect that's being talked about too little. And this sort of like why my preoccupation really with, uh, with regulation uh, and sort of like with, with being consistent, clear and sort of like really focusing on the desired effects and ignore those negative side effects. So this links nicely to Commissioner Hill's uh, reality check mm -hmm. uh, of, of regulation. Are there any suggestions? Is there any input from the panel to Commissioner Hill how that reality check could look like? Uh, have we received, have we achieved the appropriate level of regulation now, for instance, in the banking industry, and now is the time to sit back <coughs> and you know, take a second look? Or yeah, is more to be expected, is even more necessary? Yeah, I think for me, the first reaction to this um, would be to say, let's pause for a moment. There is a lot of regulation on its way until 2018. Many things have been implemented. And uh, he made a comment that he wants to see how this regulation really works uh, in a combined way. We always look at individual elements, but we did not have a chance to really look at how do things work combined in a, in a combined way. And I think, therefore, we would need some time to really understand the consequences of the regulation which is on its way. So I'm, I, w I would be in favor of having a pause and see what is the combined picture and then decide whether one has to adapt here and there, or whether more is needed. I think too much has been brought on its way during the last five years. I understand where we have been coming from, looking at the financial crisis, 
but at the same time we have to see when you speak to board members of banks, uh, they always uh, tell me, look, I can hardly digest what I have to uh, do and how I have to change my, my bank and uh, they need time to really implement everything and I would really uh, look uh, for time to give them the time to implement the changes which have been brought on the way to you for four years ago. So that's important to me. Does that resonate with the private financial sector? Yeah, I'd like to give you two examples. As, as a principle, I think it is very obvious from our regulation in our industry that we are required to de-risk. Yeah. On the other hand, we are basically listening to a uh, real economy uh, and also politicians we, that more risk needs to be taken. Um, and uh, that basically is a mismatch. And uh, if basically banks de-risk, de -risk, somebody else has to take these risks. Yeah. And the two examples I want to state is um, we are just launching a campaign <laughs> to basically uh, foster equity investment among individuals as opposed to American uh, hedge funds, yeah? to basically also have the individuals in the country participate in the economic development and, and also take some risks, yeah? which banks are not supposed to take anymore with the savings of the same people, by the way. And the other example is, um, it was mentioned earlier this morning, that um, the asset backed securities market is supposed to be reopened. Now, from the regulation that we are now facing, it's almost impossible for banks, who understands the risk behind these products, to invest. Yeah? We have plenty of liquidity, but we are basically prohibited uh, to invest in these products. Now, the alternative investors are non-banks, like we can also call them shadow banks, at least less regulated, yeah? including insurance companies, by the way, and, and pension funds, yeah? or private individuals. Yeah? Is that the intention? That basically people who don't understand the credit risk of the SME business, for example, are now supposed to take these risks? Yeah? Because ideally, the banks should uh, offload the total risk, by the way. That's the new uh, parag paradigm that basically all the risks, including the equity piece, is sold. Yeah? So the risk is basically outside the banking system, great success, but it's still there. So, Professor Pratt, is that the intention of the ECB? <laughs> um, the debate on regulation first, and then I go to the banks. Um, you have regulation and you have economic and business culture. So we have to think a little bit about that uh, because regulation very often tries to force some business culture in societies and very often does it in very wrong ways. And uh, so for example, um, if you look at the diffusion of ITC, IC, uh, in information and communication technologies, one of the main reasons it seems why some countries in Europe are not growing since the mid-90s, I'm thinking about a country like Italy in terms of productivity. Uh, so it's well before the financial crisis where productivity stopped, really stopped, you know, growing, growing. And then you, you try to, to find what are the reasons for that. And, uh, for example, you see that for very small companies, the diffusion is very difficult to do. The very small companies, tiny companies. Uh, it's, the, 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 the company is just a little bit larger, it's okay, but the very tiny ones. So you see a relation of lack of diffusion of technology and the size of companies. And the size of companies is very much linked to regulation on the labor market, for example, in countries like Italy, but some other countries like France uh, and a few other countries. Uh, don't know them all, but uh, where you see the structure, the landscape, the in industrial organization is very much linked to uh, some social laws which have been designed for good intentions very often, but with very unintended consequences which are very difficult to track. I gave you one which is a diffusion of technology. It's linked to the size of companies. And of course, the more you have black markets, the more difficult it is to diffuse technologies because the, most often these technologies provide for transparency as well. So it's incompatible with the black market. Just to tell you how complex the problem is. Another point with the culture, which is, shows you regulation tries to address sometimes, sometimes good bad, and bad, <coughs> but the problem is very deep, is a question of meritocracy, uh, which is not in your list, and uh, versus networks of loyalties and how do you define lo loyalties. You can see that in the composition of board members in some countries where you find the same people, you know, uh, it's very net <laughs> networked in terms of supervisory board representations. That's called loyalty sort of systems versus meritocracy systems. Uh, regulation like in Italy, for example, tries to address this problem by saying, you know, you cannot go in too many boards at the same time. And that's why you have a very difficult interaction between regulation trying to address 
some of the problems, or the other way, uh, depending on lobbyists and, and, and the political winds, how they come. So it's very difficult to disentangle that. That's why when in the list where you say we need more, more regulation or lesser regulation, I think it's very complicated things, and you have to go, unfortunately, very much in the details of, the, of these societies. I talked to a German firm having uh, bought you know, another firm in, in France, very similar, or in Italy, for example, the north of Italy, very similar sort of uh, production. And you can see in highly regulated environments sometimes uh, that some firms can be extremely efficient. It's the same sort of uh, regulatory environment, north of Italy, for example, uh, compared to the south of Italy. So we have to, we have to really dig really uh, profoundly into that. Well, just I, I pass. When you say on banks, you're, you're forced to de-risk. Well, what usually regulation tries is that you don't leverage too much, <laughs> that you reduce your leverage and your liquidity, uh, your liquidity exposure, of course. No, I fully agree with you in that I was 10 years in the Basel Committee on Regulation, and then mm -hmm. after Basel 2.5, for me, it was Not me true. as a simple human being, it became too complicated. For me, it's impossible to, to follow, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why you say oppose. In, in, in supervision, in banking supervision, what you have in general uh, is, is the prevention side. Uh, so you try to regulate before the accident comes. I think our societies have invested, compared to the energy for, uh, sector, for example, on our payment systems, we have massively underinvested in tail events, tail risks, mm -hmm. uh, in the financial sector. So when things happened in 2008 with Lehman Brothers and others, we were totally lost, you know, and uh, societies didn't know how to react, and that led to a number of uh, reactions and, 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 and hysteresis effect, you know, and all these things happened later. So I think uh, priorities, that's what we try to do in Europe now, but it's a long way, unfortunately, uh, because we underinvested in what do we do under tail events. And we try pr preventive to, you know, to, to constrain business in many, many areas and became so complicated. And I thought we, we, we got it wrong in a, in a in certain way. We, we should have worked, you know, contingency plans much more uh, rather than try to regulate so much as we do now. Now we try to rebalance it a little bit. We'll see what happens. So, but Commissioner Hill positioned regulation as a response to the financial crisis. I also sense in this group that you know some people have a you know challenging view currently of the level and degree of regulation. You're positioning regulation as a culture-building device, if I understand it correctly. Yes. Um, so, do yeah. we think that regulation can set the right incentives yeah, to foster growth going forward, and how should that look like? A good summary. I would have some mixed feelings on that. I think it very much depends on where we're addressing regulation. And when I said earlier, sort of like in my sector, obviously there are parts of that, which is a pure monopoly business, you need regulation. And there it's all about the quality of that regulation. What incentives does it say in terms of where the development is? Is it investment? Is it efficiency? Is it technology? Whatever you want to drive, you will ultimately get by some good regulation. And there's no sort of like choice to do it otherwise because of the monopoly situation. On the other hand, in pure market situations, I think there, uh, and, and to address one of the points you made, uh, Professor Pratt, I think, again, that we need to see what does regulation lead to. Yeah, if the regulation is in order, I mean, because of some, some situation of smaller companies and their sort of like access to the labor market, rather than putting another regulation on top, which then fosters the deployment of technology into these companies, I think we should try then to address the root cause. Yeah, and therefore work on the labor markets first, rather than to put one layer above the other in terms of regulation, which at some point is no longer consistent. Take another example from the, from the energy sector. At some point, society got aware of the side effects and the collateral damage of CO2 emissions. All fine, sort of like people said, the market does not correctly value that. That is correct. Therefore, it set up a separate market which valued the price of CO2. Yeah, so I would have said, this is positive regulation really addressing a market failure. But what did it do then? I mean, afterwards it established that, it put another regulation on top which said, we like renewables, therefore we need to incentivize that on top. We want energy efficiency, therefore special subsidies and special support for that. By doing so, you effectively killed the original regulation of setting up a market for CO2 by too many side effects acting on the same topic. Uh, and therefore, that's my caution or cautious approach to regulation. Always worry about the side effects first, and that goes a bit in your direction as well of worrying about tail events. Those things that are typically overlooked when we design something, this is actually the one area we should focus on before implementing something. 
what about Bayer? Is that you know you have a banking history? You're probably looking at the you know quality and quantity of banking regulation and ask yourself, okay, you know what would happen to my company if some similar wave of regulation would you know would hit me? How do you think about that? Well, it already has. Uh, the chemical industry is not regulation free. Um, but I, I completely agree with Mr. Schaefer. I don't think, well, it would be pushing it too far if we said that regulation is driving growth. But it can provide a framework. And uh, I go back to what I, I said before. Um, we, if we have a stability in our regulatory framework, then we all can adjust. And I think over time, we develop new views. Our society develops new views on things. And therefore, uh, there might be some times when new um, political thinking and therefore also new regulation comes in place. But then again, um, after this shift has happened, we need some stability again. If we put one law uh, above the other, then we have exactly the effects that uh, Mr. Schaefer has described. So this health check or reality check seems to be a sensible thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good. So I think we have tackled the issue of regulation. Given that we had the Frankfurt Finance Summit, I would quickly like to come back uh, also to the uh, conditions in the markets for you know, bank financing and alternative financing. Currently, bank financing provides about 70% of external company funding. Can increased capital markets funding, like you know, broader, deeper corporate bond and securitization markets, and a broader set of capital providers, um, like venture capital, uh, as intended by the EU, can that really have significant positive impact on Europe's growth prospects at this stage, given the responses that I've received from you earlier in this session? Yes. Yeah. Share with us oh, your thoughts, yeah. please. Yeah. I think uh, Commissioner Hill uh, addressed this uh, point also earlier when he spoke about the capital union. What we need is really a diversified range of financing products to really finance uh, companies and individual, individ individuals at all levels. Uh, let's start with uh, venture capital. I think um, the EU, as well as uh, the member states, we try to boost venture capital because venture capital is the basis for innovation and um, innovation leads to job creation. And finally, these small companies which we support over time grow into the middle stand and from the middle stand into large companies and global players. So they are extremely important. And at the same time, we have these huge technical changes at the moment. So we need innovation at the very beginning. Just to give an example, KFW is also launching an initiative together with the uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs to boost venture capital in Germany. We are going to invest over 400 million in the next five years in venture funds, in the growth phase, not in the seed phase, because there at the moment is enough money for the seed phase, but we want to focus on the growth phase where companies really lack supply um, of financing. And with this money, we can then leverage up to 2 billion um, financing in venture capital. We also will launch a public co-investment fund. Uh, this public co-investment fund bring, will bring another 500 million of venture uh, capital to the market. And so we hope by doing this, this will really, really stimulate um, and raise the interest of uh, institutional investors to go into venture funds. Because at the, we saw in Germany, and I'm sure it's the same in Europe, that investors have so many opportunities uh, globally. They can go to the US and invest in funds there or they can come to Europe, and we want to make sure that they invest in funds here in Germany, but also um, on a European scale. So that's the topic of venture capital, which I think at the moment is a, uh, everybody talks about it, but an extremely important one to foster innovation. The other important topic to me is this balance between bank financing and capital markets financing. Um, work, we all have worked for German banks, we know that well, we all work with bank loans a lot and that our clients um, they also are used to bank loans but they also have to have a chance to diversify so i would like to shift to more bond financing private placement financing uh, we will not reach um, a level what we see in the us at the moment where i think you have 80 percent uh, capital markets and 20 percent uh, bank loans it will take time but i think in germany you have just the opposite 20 30 percent uh, capital markets financing, the rest is bank financing, and I want to see this rise. So extremely important because this will then allow companies, also smaller companies, middle stands companies, access, access different sources, which is important when you look at the coming regulation. So 
bank debt financing is important. We spoke about the securitization. I have uh, huge hope that this European securitization market will open again, which will allow banks um, to work with their balance sheet, do lending in the SME space, and then place it on in the capital markets, another field which I think is really key. And the fourth field I would like to raise is um, equity financing, access to stock market. I think Mr. Schäfer and Mr. Lutz mentioned it as well. Um, going to the stock market is still not uh, seen as an attractive alternative in Europe and in Germany. There are, at the moment, there's a round table in, put in place by, again, the Ministry of Economic Affairs to deal with the fact how can we attract more fast-growing, innovative companies to make sure that they go to the German stock market and create something like an apple. I don't want to exaggerate from the beginning, but to create something where companies like this high technology global players can yeah, get money and uh, find their home. So four elements which I think are really important when you speak about uh, the financing, um, the game changer coming out of financing equity, bank financing versus capital markets, SME, and venture capital. So I understand you're putting quite a bit of focus on you know, SMEs, and let's talk mm -hmm. about the large companies in a second. Um, you know, taking a look from the private banking uh, world, you're responsible for commercial banking. Do you see a shortage uh, of your, in your customer base uh, of alternative sources of funding? No, we don't cover SMEs so far in Germany. There's certainly no uh, soldiers in the, in the big company mm -hmm. environment, for sure not. Three additional observations I would like to add to Ingrid's comments. First of all, uh, for the time being, financial institutions, certainly banks, have a preference for loans over securities for accounting reasons. Yeah? I think that is uh, important to note. So there is an embedded uh, uh, incentive to rather go for loans than to go for securities, <coughs> number one. Number two um, is that uh, I think the the, the uh, exercise we did here in Germany with the M-Bond segment, where basically medium-sized companies uh, issued documentation lied to private individuals, that didn't work out too well. I think that is not the right route, but at least we tried. So the, the try and error, I think, is a good thing. And lastly, um, maybe a question to the audience, who can basically assess uh, the entrepreneurial capabilities of a uh, small business better? The person who knows this business inside out and sits in San Francisco or in Berlin or anywhere and basically gets an offer from this uh, person with a business plan uh, to basically fund him, debt or equity. Secondly, um, who can better assess um, uh, is it the client base of this uh, service provider or is it the local uh, branch hero of a bank? Yeah, uh, who basically has all these businesses in the city but he only has one or two of each. Uh, he has no interest or no capacity to understand all the business models. I think the, the internet, that's of course crowdfunding um, in, in various forms, presents an enormous opportunity for that underserved segment, very obviously, um, because information is so available. And uh, yes, we need some infrastructure for this in terms of documentation uh, requirements. Uh, if you talk to these people, they basically all end up with the partiality of Stalin, I think Martial, <laughs> uh, but there's basically no uh, legal framework for this kind of business that makes it easy for small uh, sums of money to actually put that into work. Yeah? I, I'm convinced that for the small business uh, industry, uh, funding-wise, this is the perfect solution. If the basic the infrastructure is provided legally and, and, and technology is already there, of course, um, that's a big opportunity uh, and will certainly be better than bank financing yeah. for these venture capital type because this small is always a venture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, you have a also established uh, uh, craftsmen in, in cities who basically do plumbing. They have basically also funding to, funding to needs. They have, they have more the sort of the customer approach uh, to financing the, uh, the service provider uh, in a way uh, like a cooperative. Yeah? So let's switch focus to the you know fast growing and large companies that uh, you know are in need of capital. How would you see the availability? of instruments and also, also the depth of these markets for these instruments with regards to your financing needs? Well, certainly for us, I don't think it's an issue. I think the availability of funds across all types <coughs> of instruments, I mean, it's absolutely there. It's from bank lending all the way to capital markets and all sort of like levels of instruments. It's in our case also infrastructure financing, be it on the project finance level, be it on the equity contributions for others sort of like who co-invest and co-engage in, in uh, structures. 
So I think that is really sort of like the availability is not the topic. From a point of view of the, of the conditions, I think it's highly competitive. Uh, honestly, sort of like for me, it may sound strange. To me, interest rates are way too low. Yeah, they're no longer sort of like an adequate compensation for the risk that's taken and sort of like in a company that's heavily engaged in heavy assets, I think judging the risk right and getting also the right returns uh, for those risks I think is crucial and therefore the current financial market I think is falsifying our view on, uh, on that topic. And the last element obviously of low interest rates, uh, I think it hits obviously certain parts of the financial sphere. In the real economy I think it's pensions, mm -hmm. which is a real problem in that, in that current environment. But I think we'll also see that in the insurance sector, I think we see it in parts of the banking sector going forward, that this low interest rate environment drives us in the wrong direction. And therefore, I'm extremely cautious on that topic. And again, it may sound strange that someone from a company says interest rates are too low, mm -hmm. but I really <coughs> truly believe it. Mm -hmm. I can only subscribe to that. I think uh, companies of our size have never really experienced a real credit crunch. I think we always had ex access to capital even, even during the financial crisis. Um, and this is particularly because of the fact that we are so diversified in the financial means that are available to us. So basically at a time when it was difficult for banks to provide loans, we had more access to capital markets. Um, and there was a price for that, of course, yeah. We had higher interest rates at that time, but uh, money was available. Um, I, I agree that at the moment, interest rates are certainly too low, even from my perspective. Uh, I think uh, we, have, uh, we are risking that people forget that there's a value to money uh, if interest rates stay at that level. So uh, therefore, uh, just uh, flooding the market with liquidity, and that goes back to your initial question, is it financing or investments that we're lacking? It's certainly the latter, not the former. Very good. So I think we, you know, somehow have to come to an end. Let me, um, you know, quickly recap. I think we have explored opportunities uh, for growth in Europe um, and some roadblocks um, to progress. Um, we've evaluated potential game changers. We have added another one, which is this inst institutional uh, infrastructure. Um, I think not all options that uh, we have discussed in this panel uh, will be met with unanimous approval. Some of the ideas are radical and would involve some trade-offs uh, to go beyond economics uh, requiring a new political consensus. Let me maybe finish the group with uh, two more questions on this, you know, on these political Im 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 implementation and political implications. Can Europe pull off such an agenda consisting of all the, you know, topics that we you mentioned in this in this panel today. Yes or no? Yes. 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 yes we can. Yes, yes. But we have to. <laughs> <laughs> so this is very encouraging. Now I have another one. Will European governments start making structural reforms in the sense of the previously mentioned game changers, knowing that they have additional time thanks to quantitative easing? No. No. Who else is in the no camp? Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean, this uh, monetary accommodation is a window. Uh, it supports the cycle. I know in the monetary union, nobody's happy uh, because it's too much or too little, uh, but it supports, it supports the recovery. I think no, no doubt for that. But it's, as I said before, a cyclical recovery. So it's a window of opportunity that has to be seized by, by governments. Uh, and they have to take into account the fact that what we discussed here, the slowdown of productivity, has started in, the, in 2000 already. And uh, so before the crisis, and the crisis has exacerbated the problem very much. So there are many questions then following on debt sustainability, of course, a chance, I mean, in, in another chance, but in Germany, you have less debt in general, in a society in general, which is a very good environment, of course, in other countries, it's not the case. So you still have a lot of legacy, uh, legacy issues uh, that you have to deal with. So I think many countries have understood that. The question, as you know, is always implementation. I think there are some, as has been said, encouraging signs in some countries. We have mentioned Ireland, uh, Spain, uh, Portugal. It's still very difficult for these societies, but, uh, but it's on the way. Uh, the, the question when, which we flagged at the ECB sometime, it's first monetary policy cannot do it alone. I mean, it, it's obvious, and that was your first question, uh, one of the first questions today. But the sense of urgency also, because it's a long period of uh, low or negative growth in many countries. And so it, it, you, go, you are probably in vicious circles where people revise downwards. They, 
price uh, future inflation expectations and growth expectations downwards, this, then, then you get trapped in a sort of under, underemployment equilibrium like the Japanese have. And so, uh, so that's where you have to really to put all the means together to get out of this. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's not the only game in town, as, as you rightly said. True. I sense energy level here on my left-hand side. Yeah. Dr. Hengster. I, um, I'm clearly in the positive camp. And I would like to answer this with yes. And I was uh, really happy when I heard it uh, earlier from Mr. Grillo and also from Commissioner Hill that there are many, many positive signals. And it's not just spring feeling. It's, uh, you can feel it everywhere. And uh, you mentioned this as well. Uh, it will take a long time. Of, and of course, we're just in the, in the beginning. But the signals we can observe are really reassuring. I would not have expected this happen so quickly after um, yeah, the crisis we had. And uh, you mentioned Portugal, you mentioned Ireland, you mentioned Spain. Unemployment is uh, going down. Um, the deficit, the, public, the government def deficit is going down. Uh, growth is back, um, more higher growth than you can see it in Germany, above 2%. I think these are really uh, promising signals. And you, there is a lot of debate also in other countries. Look to France, look to Italy. Italy has uh, just, I think, agreed on a labor market reform, which is unique uh, and, and uh, really Judicial. something very, very new for the Italian market. So overall, I'm very op I'm optimistic. It's hard work. But I think uh, we have all the instruments um, at our hands to make this a success. Can I still disagree? Yes, please. <laughs> I don't want to leave that panel to a negative note here, but I no. utterly sort of like disagree, really. I think sort of like we're in the deepest part of the winter. We see some first of these spring flowers getting up sort of like, and we take that as a positive sign. I think they will die sort of like soon. I think this flush of cheap money, honestly, I think in all of the economies of the South, it was a contributor to the problems that we now have, because these Southern economies benefited from the Euro over years by no longer paying 10, 12, 14% interest, but suddenly four or five. They did not sort of like restructure their countries. They did not restructure their public True. debt. Yeah. They did not act on that. No, now, Germany, were. on the other hand, I mean, is now taking back, and it's, it's, it used to have sort of like a phase of strong structural reforms in Germany. We're giving up many of those today, yeah? and we're going back to sort of like less flexibility on the labor markets, earlier pensions, yeah? all of these social benefits that suddenly sort of like bloom. And I absolutely agree sort of like with Mr. Grillo in the sense that low oil prices, a cheap euro and cheap sort of interest rates, they're not to stay. Yeah, they now give us the feeling that we have a spring That's, here. Yeah. But for me, we're still in deep winter. And unless we solve the structural issues, and again, I just see way too little on that window. one. That's the window. Yeah. Of but then we need to use it. Mm -hmm. Terrific. I think this uh, brought about some additional insights. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists for this engaged uh, discussion. I hope uh, we can kick off now the lunch break, however, with a positive yeah, spin. Can you do that? And uh, looking forward to uh, additional interesting discussions and panels here. Mr. Fed, you want to take over?